everybody inherently and intrinsically understands how important water is. And yet we recognize that we don't put enough value on it, that maybe there's enough people working on the problem. And we see the global ramifications of that, especially as the climate changes and we're seeing increased water scarcity in some areas. And we read reports and news reports of communities that are impacted by really, you know, tough water quality challenges, etc. We all uh, have an empathy towards like the need and desire for clean and fresh water um, as part of a, a core sort of um, part of our survival. Welcome to this week's episode on Leaders on a Mission, where I'm joined by inspiring leaders driven by the impact of creating a healthy and sustainable world. Now, in today's episode, I'm joined by Nigel Sharp, CEO of Aquaga, a mission-driven company really created with an explicit mission of positive social impact, dedicated to the destruction of PFAS, or commonly known as forever chemicals. I've searched high and wide across the US for, for British people that have uh, decided to go and live in wonderful places like Tacoma and uh, found Nigel. So Nigel, thanks so much for kind of coming, giving up your time. I know you're a very busy man. Thank you, Simon. It's a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you. Great stuff. As we sit here today, right, and uh, I don't know, you reflect on I don't know, your career, the last 15 years or so. What do you think has really helped kind of, I suppose, shape who you are today? But I'm thinking from a professional viewpoint. It's really interesting, right? As we as we come into our sort of you know early professional careers, we're we're faced with a series of what we sort of see as self set limitations, the things that we've been told we can do, the things that we've been told our our degree or education will allow us to do, and the opportunities that exist out there. Um, and yet, once we actually get out in the working world, you know, we quickly realise that the other people in the working world aren't necessarily that much smarter or that much you know harder working than we are. And in many respects, like you know, there is a lot. Of of um, innovative thinking and thoughts and ideas that we have coming into the, into the working world. Um, so I've had a very fortunate journey that like very early on in my career, I've had a chance to work in very highly innovative enterprises, sort of social enterprise type work, all the way across to getting involved in startups. And really now the majority of my working career has been in the world of sort of in startups, either creating and building my own companies or working to support and help others build their companies. With all of that, I, I live in this sort of like really magical space in the world where we can see problems and we can like end up like, you know, looking to like create and, uh, and build solutions for those. And maybe the only story arc that sort of happened along that path that's been interesting uh, in my career specifically has been that the more I've done of this stuff, the more I've realized that it takes the same amount of effort to work on an interesting app idea or a e-commerce uh, company, et cetera, et cetera, as it does to build something that's meaningful, both socially impactful or environmentally impactful. Um, and so therefore more and more of the work that I've done in the last, I would say at least sort of six to seven years, maybe eight years, has been moving more and more in that direction of like social and environmental impact as part of a core thesis of, of the business development that we've, uh, we've put together. What brought you into that world then? What was it? There's a few things. I think a uh, couple of little side stories here. Keep them really brief, though. Uh, I had an opportunity coming pretty much out of university to go over to a country called Armenia and get plugged into a project called the TUMO project, the T-U-M-O project, TUMO, uh, which is now one of the world's largest creative technology centers for kids. It is a center that teaches digital media, game design, web design, animation to basically 12 to 18 year olds, um, but on a scale that has never been done before. This project has now expanded and now operates in I think about seven countries um, around the world and is a huge hub of uh, sort of like really creative technology usage and you know had an opportunity to, to engage that. The important piece of that story though is that as we opened the very first center which had like a thousand computers out on the main floor just to give you some sense of scale and the kids came in for the very first time their eyes all lit up at the opportunity. This is in a developing country where you know they otherwise wouldn't have had access to anywhere near the kind of resources and equipment we were able to provide them. Um, and they just lit up at sort of the energy and the opportunity and the investment that was being placed into them and giving them access to this, this incredible resource. I think that was the moment, probably the first moment I saw like the impact of working on something that is you know socially impactful, especially um, in a country like that, and seeing the actual like sort of radical change. The projections we had is that within 10 years, about 10 to 15% of the entire country's population would have gone through the program. 
all of that's come about, but now you have it expanded into multiple countries and you sort of see seeds and programs and things you start, you know, when you're given enough time in your career over a 10, 12, 15 year period to very quickly sort of see like, oh, wait a minute, this is having like global impact. And the ability to do that has been really transformative to me. The second point of that story is as I made the leap over to the US um, around eight years ago, there was a key moment there that living in places like Boulder, Colorado. And then I also lived in Alaska as well uh, for a lot of my sort of working period. It was really interesting that you're living in places that the environment is so heavily celebrated by the population, right? People are out there, they're outdoorsy, they want to go out and they want to do those things. And therefore, recognizing the importance and the need for us to be custodians of of keeping a, a greater um, environment becomes more and more uh, clear as to do that. And I think the empowerment that comes through doing startups, recognizing like, oh, oh, you can work on the hardest problems. You can deal with the toughest things. And there are opportunities and people that want to back that and support those kind of activities. It's the great thing about working and living in amongst like, you know, the startup community more broadly. And have you seen the involvement of that ecosystem? You know, the investment, the ideas, the thesis that you can actually do what you've said, right? You can go and grow and run a positive company that's profitable, but having social and economic kind of uh, impact at the heart of it. We're in a major shift, a major transition right now here across the world, right? Like this is this is the moment where the new generation, millennials and younger, I would say, are all kind of a little bit frustrated and there's a great desire for them to be working on things that are more impactful. And that's been expressed through, you know, all of the sort of, you know, job analysis that goes out there. There's a, there's a huge amount of sort of like content around this. And especially with, the even younger generations that are like plugged in um, to social media, et cetera, from the get-go, they are very, very aware of like what is happening both at social and environmental levels globally. Um, and they have access to that information and they, and they want to feel empowered to work on it. So yeah, we are at a uh, crossroads where no longer are you building businesses just for the sake of making profits, but now making impacts with those businesses is becoming even more um, relevant every single day. And we're seeing that new generation of sort of, let's call them young entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs getting in and building businesses that want to have that greater impact. So we're at an inter- interesting, critical time, I think, for uh, for the world and for, for business as a whole. I suppose it probably came for you. It probably came down to a decision. You know, there's so many causes to focus on. So, you know, you've chosen something which is very topical at the moment, right? So the, the whole kind of PFAS forever kind of chemicals you know, scenario and the challenges that brings. How did the journey with Aquaga came come along? You know, how how did it start? And give us some context around that. Yeah, Simon. I mean, I think that's that's the challenge, right? Like, there is <laughs> the world is not short of problems, and uh, there isn't enough time in the day to work on that many different things. And I think that having the opportunity to have worked in educational technology for a while, um, and then having the opportunity to be working within sort of the academic frameworks of universities and working on multiple social programs where we dealt with programs that were focused on food and housing and other like, you know, big, big challenges to then see that one topic kept getting my interest and kept getting more traction with me. And that was sort of the broader area on sort of what they call the blue tech field, right? So things that are kind of like, water related, um, but also just water as a whole seems like a, a generationally changing and significantly important topic. It's it's one thing that universally, I don't have to express to anyone how important water is. Everybody inherently and intrinsically understands how important water is. And yet we recognize that we don't put enough value on it, that maybe there's enough people working on the problem. And we see the global ramifications of that, especially as the climate changes and we're seeing increased water scarcity in some areas. And we read reports reports and news reports of communities that are impacted by really, you know, tough water quality challenges, et cetera. Um, we all uh, have an empathy towards like the need and desire for clean and fresh water um, as part of a, a core sort of um, part of our survival. So the moments of inspiration for me were actually like going and attending uh, a couple of water conferences, but one stands out to me above all, which was I got a chance to go over to the uh, Siwi conference in uh, in Sweden. And it was kind of a worldwide focused water conference. And I hadn't really understood or taken the time in my life to take a couple of days to really like 
understand the scale and the scope of the water challenges that, that we're facing as a civilization right now. And it is on a it is on a mega scale, right? And it is impacting billions of lives. And therefore there was a call from somebody who's now an investor in our company, but at the time, you know, I was just an audience member listening to him speak. But a guy called Will Sani, um, who's also a fantastic person for you to interview at some point. But Will uh, was um, you know, he just speaking in, in this audience and most of the people in the audience were folks that worked at, you know, at the US or the World Bank or like, you know, large political government organizations, et cetera, regulatory organizations. And he made a call out and said, like, if there's any innovators in the audience that can join into this sort of like challenge set that we have around water, you know, now's the time to get involved. And I think that ask and that call out into the audience really hit me. Uh, it hit me at an inflection point in my career, a moment in time that really is really transformative for me. And that's what started me down the path of wanting to get involved in that. And that's where we formed Aquaga. Prior to knowing we were going to work on PFAS, we started a company that had a, a core public benefit mission to improve water quality in the world. Um, I saw that as a important facet that I wanted to work on. And then we started exploring how to go and sort of deal with that. So tell us a little bit about the problem that you solve and even a, a little bit around the scale of the problem. Yeah, it's so funny because now as the weeks go by, more and more people hear about this. And to give people a sense of scale up front, PFAS, the forever chemicals, is probably on the scale of asbestos and CFCs kind of combined. These are common terms that we've heard of from folks that fought these back in the 80s. But now this is kind of our generational challenge. It is arguably the largest environmental contaminant in human history. And we have a global battle against this chemical because it's impacting almost everyone, right? Um, what is PFAS and what is this battle we're taking on? Well, the forever chemicals are commonly found in products that either require like waterproofing um, to become non-stick or to become fire retardant, right? So historically, it's been found in brands like Teflon, Gore-Tex, Rain-X, Scotchgard. It's the material that makes those things non-stick and waterproof. Um, it allows things to be fire retardant. And unfortunately, we are all probably within 10 feet of some products that contain a certain amount of PFAS. And and we are ingesting PFAS because it ends up um, back in our water supplies. And commonly, that's one of the, the intake mechanisms for us, as well as in our food as well. The relevance of this has really become in sort of the last 10 years where more and more and more uh, large scale health studies have shown causative impacts uh, from PFAS impacting people and public health. And as we've all just gone through a major global public health challenge uh, with the pandemic, I think we're all acutely aware of how important our shared public health is. And with a specific contaminant, we're seeing causative links to things such as pancreatic cancers in women, testicular cancers in men, thyroid diseases. Uh, we're seeing pregnancy complications being caused, as well as there's new studies coming out that are now showing correlative evidence towards things like obesity and autism and other areas. And so there's a lot of like, you know, work being done to sort of try and figure out exactly what PFAS's uh, real global impact is, but undoubtedly is having a significant toll on public health globally right now, um, and especially in the hotspots where people have been exposed to PFAS. And a lot of that exposure um, has come from these firefighting foams that have been used. So if whenever we sort of imagine a movie where you've got an airplane that's on fire and they've sprayed it down, and they cover it in that sort of foam, it's this aqueous film forming foam, AFFF firefighting foam. Um, often that stuff is like leached off of those runways, those airports, those you know wildfire areas, ended up in local water supplies, food supplies, and uh, has come back to sort of uh, really bite us the back end. That's one cause. Obviously, there's another area, which is that if you happen to live around an industrial facility that utilizes PFAS, um, and certain industries use PFAS more than others, or you're near an industrial plant that makes PFAS, then there's also a potential risk that you've been exposed uh, through, you know, greater sort of like local environmental contamination. So yeah, there is a lot happening in this space. Uh, there isn't a state in the US that has not been impacted, and I can't think of uh, any map that I've seen that hasn't shown most countries having some sort of like PFAS contamination. But there has been some really interesting studies uh, in the last couple of years that have really showcased just the sheer spread of this problem. And like, you know, this global cleanup that's going to have to be uh, taken aboard for us to protect public health going in the future. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember growing up like years ago, and I think it was at the time certain aerosols uh, were, were kind of banned at the time. I think it was probably more for CFCs. Uh, you know, as it were. So the question I have was, how much of this stuff is from years gone by with products that have been banned 
and you know compared to what's being used right now as it were what are your thoughts on that Let's dig in a bit deeper then. So, so PFAS, when we talk about it, is really a class of, you know, somewhere between like eight and 15,000 compounds, right? So it's really a class of chemicals and not a singular chemical. But there are common ones that we've talked about and some that we have banned over the years. So we've seen compounds like PFOA, PFOS being some of the biggest perpetrators. These are longer chain PFAS mm-hmm. molecules. Um, and we did ban some of those back in the 80s and 90s, you know, for various Uses. And we see if you go to the supermarket now and you try and buy a nonstick pan, a lot of them will say PFOA free. But what happened, unfortunately, is that the companies that saw that ban invented a new chemical that was maybe a six carbon chain version, right? Like things like Gen X, et cetera, that were replacements for that. Still a PFAS compound, broadly speaking. And now we're seeing new health data and new studies showing that some of these new replacement compounds are as toxic, if not more toxic, than some of the original ones that we banned. It really varies, right? And again, I'm not an epidemiologist. I can't express like, you know, which ones are worse and better, only that there is, you know, a huge amount of uh, shared science and research out there showcasing the dangers of this. The other thing that's important to understand about these compounds is they have this moniker, the forever chemicals, because they don't naturally break down in the environment, right? They take thousands of years to break down. And so therefore, going back to one of the motivations of me getting involved in the topic was that there's very rarely an opportunity you get to work on something that could have, you know, a generation's worth of impact or two generations worth of impact. Never mind a hundred or a thousand generations worth of impact. It is a, it is a really crazy sort of thing to think uh, that, you know, you can have this long lasting impact and therefore see the impact, you know, in the future of time impacting billions, if not even trillions of lives. It seems like a very noble thing to sort of be working on. Um, there are a lot of smart people uh, now trying to sort of tackle the challenge. And yes, it can be like to sort of the crisis that we saw around like CFCs, which funnily enough were also a fluorocarbon, just like PFAS is, different in its applications. But yeah, very much, uh, you know, one of those things that we've released out there that we figured out later uh, we shouldn't have done. Thank you for that. It just would have seen that all those fantastic chemists and scientists creating all these things years ago, probably creating fantastic products at the time with great functionality. But uh, you know, maybe the environment just wasn't uh, a cause of uh, concern back in those days. It's always funny looking back at these things, isn't it, and understanding the motivations for it. I think that the motivations have been fairly well documented at this point. Like, unfortunately, I think there's a certain amount of, like, you know, uh, profiteering and corporate greed that's there. I can say that because, you know, a number of these uh, cases have been uh, legally settled now and companies have been started to be held accountable for some of the actions of production here. Class action lawsuits have been filed. Billions of dollars have been sued already, but most notably, you know, you've got companies such as like DuPont, who you know settled at about 1.1 billion dollar lawsuit for PFAS uh, impacts, as well as uh, 3M most recently and most famously, one of the largest environmental contamination lawsuits in history, uh, just signed a 10.4 billion dollar um, lawsuit for some of the impacts uh, that they've had producing PFAS. And so it's really interesting that some of these corporations knowingly uh, produce this stuff and maybe had concerns around like the health impact there and hadn't pulled it back in in time uh, again that's all part of active litigation and conversation right now and f- to be honest it's not just a court of public opinion but there are active courts really working and trying to figure out where liability is held around this what i can share though is there are some interesting resources and, and things to look at there is a lawyer called rob billots who's uh, who's released a book called exposure which was turned into a movie uh, called dark waters and dark waters came out in 2019 uh, starring mark ruffalo uh, the hulk who played the, uh, the lead actor and that does a really good job of bringing people up to speed on some of the entrenched battles that happened between some of these producers and uh, local communities in the US who were impacted by it. So I highly recommend the movie. It kind of helps people bring people up to speed. There are a number of other you know, resources out on the internet as well that can really talk about some of that. And, uh, and then you can sort of decide a little bit for yourself on where the responsibility lies. Thank you for that, Nigel. Great education and knowledge. Tell me about how you go around solving this problem, you know, the technology and the innovation. Well, I guess what I'll, I'll frame for everybody uh, that's listening in is that We're in a very fortunate position that the world, generally speaking, when it comes to trying to make drinking water safe, uh, work on wastewater, et cetera, a lot of the engineers in the sort of water industry don't get to work on the most glamorous jobs in the world, right? We're not building electric cars or fusion power, et cetera. But a lot of those people have their hearts in the right place. They are trying to make drinking water safe. They are trying to uh, reduce waste to improve 
improve quality to reduce disease and other potential impacts of that. And so therefore, a lot of people do have a sort of shared public health mission in this in this space and sector. Um, so tying back to sort of a quagga coming in, I think one of the challenges is that with PFAS specifically, the tools that those different organizations have had, water, wastewater, et cetera, simply don't work for PFAS. And the tools that they existingly had don't destroy PFAS. They can't get rid of the stuff once and for all. So they end up like, you know, modifying it and, and making long chain PFAS into shorter chain PFAS and moving a problem down the line. Or they've got technologies that can filter PFAS out of the water, but then you end up with that this constant concentrated filter material that has got lots of PFAS and it has to go somewhere and you end up having to move this stuff around, but it's going to last forever. So where do you put it? What do you do with it? And so these are kind of the challenges that we've been kind of broaching as a company is that, hey, can we help provide tools and technologies that will allow people to end this problem once and for all? And that's really been the mission we've been on. And so we've been pretty innovative in that space, uh, utilizing research from a couple of major public uh, research institutions, namely the University of Washington and the Colorado School of Mines. Um, We were able to bring together some technologies that have proven to destroy long chain, short chain and ultra short chain PFAS basically using what I would describe lovingly as a pressure cooker on steroids. It is a high temperature, high pressure system uh, where we add a high pH as well. So we uh, add some caustic soda in there and it makes an environment that is very, very reactive and able to break down and rip apart these PFAS molecules, fully mineralizing them into clean water and safe salts. And so we can take toxic fluorine that's inside the PFAS and turn it into fluoride, stuff that you would find in toothpaste. And that has been pretty revolutionary. It's won multiple awards at this point. Um, and we've now done this at like, you know, some of the largest industrial scale that anyone's seen. So what, what you do, you put in the toxic water and out of it, you get drinking water and then the fluoride remains within the water? Not quite, Simon, not quite. I wish it was uh, wish it was as easy as that. When stuff gets sent to us, what we're dealing with, and I want to give people get some visualization of what we're dealing with. It's funny, I joke about the fact that nothing that we ever receive at our, you know, for our testing looks like water, right? Most of the stuff that comes to us is brown, red, black, you know, this is nasty stuff. This is the stuff that comes out of the bottom of a dredge of a landfill, right? Like it's landfill leachate. It's industrial wastewater that's gone through huge amounts of chemical processing, etc. And so this stuff is is incredibly nasty. Or it's something that's been sitting in like a fire training pond at an airfield or an air force base for 30 to 40 years, right? With all the other fun stuff that gets thrown into a random pond, right, on a base. That's the kind of stuff that we deal with day to day. So no, nobody's drinking it out the back end of our machine. But what we do is we, yes, we take that kind of wastewater, right? We're kind of the heavy lifting technology that destroys these really nasty compounds and break down all the PFAS. And we can demonstrate that through the studies and the analysis. Um, we take the PFAS and we turn the PFAS into carbonates and, and fluorides, which are safe salts, and we end up with kind of a briny water at the back end um, that isn't potable or isn't for drinking, but is absolutely safe often for like discharge or potentially to go back through the, the treatment process and pull out these salts. Our real goal is that you have this forever chemical, which is messing up a lot of other people's treatment processes and really causes a problem because that liability for that PFAS follows you no matter where you go. And even if you filter it out, it still sits there in the filter forever, right? And so we take that concentrated filter material and um, and those kind of mechanisms and we take that concentrate and we put it into our system and we break it down into the clean water and safe salts. Um, and then we discharge that down into a sanitary sewer, but no longer allowing this problem to go on and exist for thousands of more years and, and the rest of it. That PFAS is gone and it's gone forever. So tell me a little bit about some of the milestones of the company, right? In terms of where you've been able to kind of scale scale this. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, we've been in business since uh, just late 2019 and really got started. Uh, we learned about PFAS and really made a sort of leap into PFAS uh, right around March 2020. And many of us will remember what happened around March 2020, a pretty significant moment in the world as uh, the pandemic kicked into full gear. I remember coming from a conference, we talked with the Colorado School of Mines, a professor who had invented some of this technology. And just literally two days later, you know, airports were shut down, airplane, you know, flights were stopped and we went into the pandemic. And that's where we started building the company. The key milestones were in that first year, 
we were able to take and get access to some wet lab space in Tacoma, Washington. As you said, uh, that's where we're based, so just south of Seattle. We were able to then do a small batch scale demonstration. You got to remember, this was really kind of like, you know, some folks who worked at universities in their spare time trying to see if we could make and repeat some of this chemistry. And we took, you know, a very small scale, you know, secondhand reactor system that we bought from, I, I can't remember exactly where it got imported in from, but we bought the system, cooked up some PFAS, and on our very first calibration run, we were able to show some of the highest destruction mechanisms uh, around PFAS that had ever been seen, uh, some of the highest destruction rates. And that was pretty exciting. So that was like kind of like the, you know, the 2020 realm. Into 2021, uh, we then were able to sort of scale that and do this continuously. And that's a really marked uh, significant moment, right? Is the ability in water treatment and wastewater treatment to destroy something or treat something in a continuous flow. Because otherwise, you know, you can't put everything into little soup pots and cook things up, right? That just doesn't practically work. So you have to uh, be able to do things continuously. That was a pretty significant milestone. And we got to a point where we got some private investment through some angel investors, not a whole lot of investment, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars and some public investment, though, through um, grants and contracts that came through some government agencies. And we were able to sort of achieve and showcase a system that could do this continuously. That was pretty exciting. Then in 2022, the EPA, who had seen this, who had given us an award, uh, a global award, it was uh, the Destroy PFAS Challenge, and we were the first place winners in that, decided to then invest into us through their SBIR program, and we built one of the world's largest PFAS destruction units. Uh, that unit's called Eleanor, has now been out on sites and done lots of different work, but it's our, part of our Steed series development. And so in 2022, we now have one of the world's largest continuous flowing, you know, PFAS pressure cookers that's in a 10 foot shipping container that can be taken on sites. And so we built that out and that was a pretty significant milestone launching that unit through into 2023. As sort of 2023 goes off, you know, ribbon cuttings and getting that unit fully launched and then going out there um, and achieving like a pretty critical milestone of actually doing our first on-site remediation project at Fairbanks International Airport in Alaska, which has unfortunately some contamination issues at some of these uh, some of these sites where they've done fire training. Um, and we were able to make a significant impact to that site, do a remediation demonstration at a mega scale. Um, and that was really exciting. Um, and ever since then, and so into 2024, into the last few months, the most significant milestone by far is we have just completed uh, the largest PFAS treatment demonstration uh, alongside the largest PFAS treatment facility in the world. I can't go into a lot of details because unfortunately with industrial clients, information is incredibly private. What I can say is that this is a, uh, a large scale PFAS production company or companies been involved uh, historically in producing PFAS. They operate a systems at full industrial scope and scale, and we were able to very successfully demonstrate our equipment um, in that facility. And that has all just happened in just the last couple of weeks. And so here we are in the sort of May of 2024, sitting at the point where we've proven this technology out with some of the hardest and biggest customers in the world. And we are not stopping right now. Like in the next few weeks, uh, the unit is going straight from that industrial facility and it's going straight to uh, Beale Air Force Base in California, and we'll be doing an Air Force Base demonstration demonstration. And so we're kind of racking up our like outside commercial case studies and pilots and demonstrations right now, having done an airport uh, funded sort of by the FAA and Alaska to uh, Air Force demonstration funded by the DOD to a private industrial demonstration, as I just mentioned. So a lot going on at the company and it feels like, you know, uh, wheels are spinning pretty fast right now. But I want to be clear that we've still only got a few units, right? We've got a few of these units. We're sort of doing this stuff and yet the scope and scale of the problem and the magnitude of it uh, requires so many more po folks to get plugged in and engaged with the, the problem set. It sounds like you've got hundreds of people working with you as you go through the different milestones, but I know that's not the case. How many people in the company? Right now, we've just hit about 15, I think, full-time folks in the company. We achieved most of those initial milestones with about you know six to seven of us. Uh, we just scaled up to sort of 15 in this last uh, last six months or so. It has been incredible, but we are on a journey where we are continuing to add more people in. We are constantly hiring uh, for roles because we need other folks that want to make that impact. So folks who want to get involved in engineering, those who want to help us with the sales and the business development processes, the marketing, the operations. I mean, there's a lot going on at Aquaga. And yet, yes, it is a you know a small team, high performing, undoubtedly on a mission, right? And uh, at the moment, our mission is ending PFAS. And so we are all very aligned around that mission. And we're doing a lot of work in that front. And, uh, you know, our shared sort of purpose here of like improving global water quality is something that drives all of us to, to be involved. Looking now for you to achieve the goals that you want for the company, you know, what are the big challenges and headwinds you face as a CEO of the business now when you think about it? 
there's often the question thrown to CEOs of like, you know, what's the, what's the biggest challenge that's keeping you up at night? What are the concerns? And I think, you know, I, I can sort of reflect back at what the previous challenges were. Like a couple of years ago, when we had destroyed PFAS at Meaningful Scale, my biggest concern was that we would have done it and then nobody would ever hear about us because, you know, maybe we'd run out of money or do you never get a project that's significant and big enough? Um, we're at a different point now. We're now one of the front runners in the entire world uh, working on this particular problem set. And uh, we're sitting in a very strong place. And so right now, a lot of the challenges around like which partnerships do we want to grow and build upon because we want to partner with everyone, but we only have 15 people. So, you know, there's only so many partnerships we can grow and meaningfully build upon. And where can we make the most significant impact of the problem? So working on a small scale remediation site in a very remote community might be very substantially important uh, to that community. But in the global sense of the problem, having the opportunity to integrate our system into a large scale industrial plant that's producing PFAS day to day or has historically produced PFAS is way more significant in the way that you can sort of reduce global contamination, right? And so we're trying Trying to sort of make those decisions internally of where, which partnerships, which directions and segments do we want to sort of go after. Simultaneously, you know, you have to bring on board extra funding to sort of allow for that scale and growth and therefore finding and building those relationships with partners who want to fund and, and grow with us, right? And like making sure there's alignment there is personally a challenge as a CEO. That's one of my jobs is to, to make sure that we keep injecting uh, more capital in to grow these parts of our company. And lastly, you know, one of the other challenges is that just by destroying some PFAS with our big pressure cooker, we haven't solved the problem. There's still lots of other parts of the PFAS problem that need to be worked on and solved. Everything from separating, concentrating PFAS from different waste streams, and there's lots of technologies needed for that, as well as like sensing and measuring PFAS. As there's more and more regulation coming about, um, there is a great need for, for sensing and measuring. So there's a lot of applications of other technologies. And again, we really want to see ourselves as sort of tool builders, technology developers who bring those tools to market and, uh, and offer them out there. So it is very, uh, uh, very core to who we are right now. Like, well, we want to do all of those things, but, you know, limited time, limited resources, of course, like which of those do we want to tackle first and who in the team wants to spearhead certain activities. And when you think about the units you're creating here, you spoke about the 10 foot kind of shipping kind of container, which, you know, when you think about scale, is it a modular piece where you're, you're replicating the 10 foot piece or are you building things much bigger? No, that's a great question. Um, I think that's that's a big challenge for folks as they look at it and they go like, well, you know, okay, but how do you get to the big sizes we're going to need? And actually, what we found is that we've designed that system to serve a very large portion of the market because it's not just the 10-foot shipping container alone that plugs into a, you know, large-scale industrial plant, but it's in conjunction with a concentration separation technology. And that's where we're building a lot of partnerships, right? So there are other technologies that basically filter PFAS. And actually, historically, uh, we've had lots of technologies to filter water pretty effectively. And some are very commonplace, stuff that you would be aware of, like basically charcoal or activated carbon, ion exchange resins, reverse osmosis membranes. Uh, these are all pretty common technologies for filtering water. There are also some more mm. novel methods for putting PFAS out of water, uh, like foam fractionation and some other sort of uh, methods that are coming out now that are sort of exciting to sort of see some development happening in that space too. But it's a lot of those end up producing like either a wet slurry or a concentrate of some kind. And then that is where sort of we fit in. So it's a treatment train and not a singular system. It's not like, hey, hey, here you go. Here's your 10 foot shipping container. Ta-da, we've solved the problem for this big mega uh, facility or plug this into the ocean and we're done. Like that's not, not the reality. Instead, it is very much that you use these systems in conjunction with a treatment train that can process very large volumes of water, filter things down into a concentrate, and then that concentrate we process through a system like ours. And yes, at those large-scale facilities, there may be a need for multiple systems, and therefore a modular approach is one way to do it. But also for some of these industrial clients, for example, you know, you're doing sort of a build and integration um, that is more suitable for their actual infrastructure and their plant operations. So it gets technical, it's engineering, it's building products to to meet clients but these are you know um products that bring huge value to these organizations as it you know ends the liability that they could potentially have forever right with these forever chemicals your job as ceo lot the first thing that comes to mind i'm thinking about that background you had before lots of your startup experience and building ecosystems and different dynamics across a value chain for instance that sounds so well suited now to your kind of background and what you're doing right it's a, clearly about telling the story about bringing um you know different aspects of the value chain in together what part of the job the ceo day-to-day -day job do you enjoy the most and and maybe you know dislike the most 
I've been asked that question a few times, actually fairly recently, and uh, I really have only one word to answer that question, which is that the job of a startup CEO is storytelling, right? Like that's fundamentally the key of it, right? I'm not a large public company CEO where their jobs are incredibly different from what I get to do. Uh, no, I sit at the, the really fun phase of like, no, my job is to help, you know, cultivate and curate those stories, go out there and like work together with communities to help us develop a positive narrative around like big impact problems like PFAS. And uh, no, it's, it's a really exciting sort of place to be. And so, yeah, the storytelling is definitely the highlight. I mean, the worst parts of the job right now are probably centered around the amount of bureaucracy that we have to deal with. So even though we're a very small company, um, we're funded in large part right now by government funds, right? Government contracts that we're doing this work, you know, as I mentioned, like an Air Force base next week. And doing work with the government, for example, is incredibly bureaucratic and requires huge amounts of steps and reporting, etc. Often that puts people off even wanting to even go down that path and do work with the government. And yet it's super meaningful because the government ultimately is going to do a lot of the end up, the cleanup for, for you know, for the community. And uh, they take some of that responsibility there as well. And so I think like, you know, that can be draining at times. It's like dealing with the amount of like bureaucratic and, and pace adjustment, working with them where, you know, you can sit and between two conversations with them, which might take two months between a conversation, you know, we, I've got all these milestones I can talk about and they're just like, oh, cool, we're having the second part of this, this conversation, you know, and so things operate at very different paces. And that can be jarring at times and, and, and challenge. I think the word frustrating would come to mind for me, like quick startup, quick decisions, low bureaucracy, need to move forward and working with the EPA. Yeah, but you know, I see other competitors in our space who are funded by venture capital, for example, in a large part, and they have all the autonomy to make quick decisions and go fast into the rest of it. But in the end, the customer is still the same. If the customer is the government, the customer is the government. And in the end, like if you're not willing to like in, you know build that patience into your organization and like learn to go through that work that's required there and be diligent and thoughtful about like how you engage with that work, all you end up with is frustration as opposed to like understanding this is the, the diligent work of like this is the type of business we're in, right? This is not sexy. It's not glamorous, right? Again, like we're not selling high powered like electric vehicles to like premium sales points. That's not what we're into, right? We're building toxic waste disposal machines um, to make the earth a bit cleaner and to make people's water a bit safer. Final question for me, right? Um, when you think about the next five, 10 years, what kind of impact you know, can you really have? We talk about this internally as sort of like, you know, the base case versus sort of the bull case, right? Of like, you know, wildest dreams, what's the type of impact? And I think we've already made so much progress in the last few years, it's hard to believe we would even be sitting here and where we are and be able to impact as much as we have. In the last few weeks, to give you some context, Simon, we've processed and destroyed as much PFAS as we have done cumulatively in the last year and or two, right? Like it's kind of crazy how things scale and things go faster and like we're making more progress. How significant is that? Well, you start projecting out the impact that could have at I don't know, MCL levels are being put out by the EPA for drinking water, for example, you start going like, oh, we're having impacts on potentially billions of gallons of water, and that wouldn't take that long. And it wouldn't take that long to move into the trillions of gallons of water potential impacts, right? But then if you start to put that across the public health and total reduction, there's opportunities there as well. Great. No, look, Nigel, thanks so much. I mean, it's been a real education talking with you, and thanks for coming on and sharing the journey. We'll be following you and uh, wish you all the very best for the future. I very much appreciate the support, Simon. It was great to check in, talk a bit about Quagga. Um, always happy to have folks like reach out and engage with us. Aquaga.com is, is a great place to go look at stuff, but also just on social media, you know, uh, send a kind comment. It's a small team. We appreciate the kind words and we appreciate the support folks out there. And if folks want to make a jump into high impact, you know, water treatment type activities, et cetera, reach out to us, right? Like, you know, we are looking to, to scale and grow. We're looking to, to work with a lot of folks in the, com in the industry to, to make some real, real difference to this problem set and hopefully others in the future. Great stuff. Best of Thank luck. You.